Good afternoon. Wow, the room is huge today. I love it. I love it. Great way to kick off the 40th anniversary of the Columbus Metropolitan Club. Give another round of applause for 40 years. Yay. We're so excited about it. Uh, you're going to be hearing about all the great things we've got coming up. Jane mentioned a few, and you'll be seeing them in your forum flyers and online and in your email, email boxes. But we want to have you engaged this year during our 40th year of the community conversation. Today's forum is a dispatch chat. And it's our annual blue chip economic forecast. As a community tradition, this has become one of our largest and best forums, and we're looking forward to the discussion today. Bill has assured me uh, that my 401k will grow this year, and so we are looking forward to uh, that discussion. Please uh, join me in thanking our sponsors for today, uh, represented here the Columbus Dispatch, Fifth Third Bank, BDO, and Columbus State Community College. And we want to give a special shout out today as well to visiting with us our partner for today, Leadership Columbus. Let's give them all a round of applause for their support today. And then finally, to introduce our speakers, I'm going to bring forward Mr. Paul Weber, Senior VP and Director of Wealth Management Advisor at Fifth Third Bank, to welcome our speakers. Thank you. Paul. Uh, thank you, Mo. Uh, Fifth Third is extremely proud to uh, sponsor this event. This is our third year doing so. And I was just talking to Jane uh, while we were eating. Uh, when we started sponsoring three years ago, the growth of membership uh, with the Columbus Metropolitan Club has been uh, tremendous. I think it's over 30 percent. You're now at 11, uh, 1,100 members here in your 40th year, and congratulations on the 40th year. I think that deserves another round of applause. I truly enjoy this event, as I know Fifth Third does. Uh, it's, it's one of the many events that the Columbus Metropolitan Club offers, which allows us to kind of have a deep discussion as to what's happening here in Central Ohio, things that affect us as business leaders and as uh, uh, members of the community. Um, one of the things that uh, I, I appreciate is uh, Bill Lafayette's comments. And this year, we have someone else uh, with us, uh, Ben Ayers of Nationwide. Um, but uh, I don't know if everyone realizes this, but uh, Bill spends an awful lot of time uh, at City Hall. Uh, every day when I come out of the Fifth Third Building, drive down State Street, and take a, a right down Front Street, uh, many times when I'm leaving uh, late in the day, I see Bill walking across the street, uh, which uh, I found out he's talking many times to our council members and to our new, uh, our new mayor. So uh, Bill has an awful lot of influence in this, uh, this town, and I think it's great that we get to hear from him today. So uh, without uh, much more delay, I'd like to introduce uh, Ben Ayers, who is uh, the senior economic uh, economist at uh, Nationwide Mutual Insurance Company. Um, also, uh, Mark Williams, who is going to moderate, I believe, like you've done every other year, a business reporter for the Columbus Dispatch, and uh, Mr. Bill Lafayette, uh, the owner of Regionomics. So with no with further ado, please start the discussion. Thank you, Paul. Uh, Happy New Year, everyone. Thank you all for coming. Uh, my thanks to CMC for having me back for a 15th year. I'm also very excited to welcome my colleague Ben Ayers uh, from Nationwide to share thoughts on the national economy, and Mark Williams of the Dispatch, who will once again be our interlocutor. But let me start off by congratulating CMC on 40 years of community conversations. With a new year, a new mayor, and all sorts of growth and excitement in central Ohio, the theme 40 and forward is absolutely perfect. I'm really looking forward to it. I was accused of being downright giddy up here last year when I pre predicted a gain of 21,000 net new jobs in 2015, or 2.1%. In retrospect, a better description would have been down-in-the-mouth pessimist. We actually look like we, had, we got 22,000 jobs, 2.2% last year. But as I always warn, these numbers are preliminary and will be revised in March. Last year's estimates are probably much closer to reality than they have been in the past, but I wouldn't be at all surprised to see revisions this coming March that bump our growth up uh, by maybe another thousand or two. And I'm also happy to report that we're now a million job economy. 
I was expecting to see that in 2015, but after last year's revisions in our new 10 county metro area, it turned out that we crossed that line clear back in November 2013. This recovery has been very, very good for Central Ohio. Since the beginning of 2010, our employment's up nearly 14%. The U.S. is up around 10%. We have 127,000 more jobs now than we did then. That's our best five-year streak in more than 15 years. So let's have another cheerful forecast for 2016, shall we? The 2016 Regionomics Columbus forecast is for growth of 2.2% or 22,000 net new jobs. Now most national level forecasts are shading employment growth down a touch for 2016, and in fact, so am I. I'm, at, I'm betting that actual 2015 growth was a little stronger than what the statistics are showing now. Given all this, I'm expecting more and more companies to have problems recruiting top talent as the year progresses. I started paying close attention to the Columbus economy in the late 1990s, at the end of our last run of strong economic growth. Our unemployment rate then was running around 2.8%, and it was absolutely brutal. We're nowhere near there, there yet, but keep in mind that jobs are much more technically demanding than they were 20 years ago. We also have ongoing challenges with basic skills like effective communication, attention to the job, teamwork, critical thinking, and problem solving. So anything that we can do to give workers the right training, assess employer needs, and make sure that job openings and training opportunities are being communicated effectively to the labor force will be a very good thing indeed. Finally, let me return to a topic that I broached here two years ago, the problem of small business formation and entrepreneurship in Central Ohio. Using data from community research pa partners, I pointed out on this stage two years ago that Central Ohio was far below average in the number of self-employed people, the concentration of small firms, and the small business birth rate. Given that these were mostly recession-era data that I was using, I thought it would be a good idea to take another more recent look. So I replicated CRP's analysis both forward and backward to before the recession. And I wish that the news were better. We've gotten steadily worse in all those small business measures since 2007. The most recent stats show us ranking 88th out of the 100 largest metros in the US in the percentage of workers who are self-employed. 85th out of 100 in the concentration of small businesses and 82nd out of 100 in our small business birth rate. This is a serious problem that we've started working on and we really need to keep working on it. But I'm sure that we'll probably talk a little bit more about it in our conversation. So for now, I'll just wish you all a joy-filled, peace-filled, successful 2016 and turn it over to Ben. Thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you to Bill for inviting me to come out and speak today. Um, I'd like to start my comments today with a quote from the economist J.K. Galbraith. Economists do not forecast because they know. They forecast because they are asked. <laughs> so with that boost of confidence, um, I'd like to refer to the uh, forecast that's in front of you. Um, refer to several of the numbers on the page there put out from our nationwide economics group at Nationwide. Um, I'm not sure I would classify our forecast for next year as quite as giddy, um, but we are definitely cheerful and we are very optimistic about the direction that the national economy is heading. Um, 
Despite still modest real GDP growth of only about 2.4 to 2.5 percent this year in, in 2015, um, really the economy, national economy, ended the year in a much better footing than it started the year, um, mainly led by strong job growth, wage gains that are finally starting to see some pickups, and still low energy prices that are keeping down costs for consumers. All of these trends are very positive for the consumer, and that's leading us to a faster pace of consumer spending, faster pace of housing sector, faster pace of auto sales, and all that's moving the economy in a much more positive direction than we've seen for the past couple of years. Um, you know, really the saying still goes, especially in the modern economy that we have now, that as consumers go, so go the economy, and really the consumers are doing rather well. Um, consumer spending in the GDP numbers have been very strong in pretty much every quarter of the past two years. And that's a trend we expect to continue next year and leading us to a little bit of a faster pace for next year. We're hoping to get up to about 2.8, 2.9% for GDP growth next year. Now, it doesn't sound like much because it really isn't very much. Um, the long-term trend for GDP is right about 3%. So finally, this kind of meager fists and starts kind of reset or expansion is getting up to the point where we're catching up to where the long-term average is. Um, so about 2.8, 2.9% for next year, so a modest acceleration from the trend that we've seen the past couple years. Most of this is being led by job growth. Um, we've had at least 200,000, average 200,000 jobs added a month for about the last two and a half years. When you add all that up, that's a lot of jobs for the economy. It's a lot of people that have income, a lot of people that have a much better financial footing, much better consumer balance sheet in their, in their pocketbooks, and they're spending more money now. They're replacing cars that they have had for maybe a decade, maybe up to 15 years. They're finally making those decisions. Those millennials are finally moving out of their parents' basements. They're, they're buying their own homes. They're moving in a positive direction. And, and the cumulative impact of all that job growth is the main reason why we're so optimistic about where the economy is going, where we think things are going to go for the next couple years. Um, next year, we're expecting a continuation of about averaging 200,000 jobs added per month. Um, the unemployment rate, which stands about 5% right now, should probably edge down next year at a little bit slower rate than it's been the past couple years. But getting down into the fours, likely ending next year right about four and a half, right in the mid fours for the unemployment rate next year, which importantly is below most estimates of what we call full employment. Um, and so yet telling us yet again, labor market's moving us in a positive direction, the economy's finally getting back to a stronger footing that we've seen over this expansion. One quick note, I will note that the, uh, the unfortunately manufacturing is not doing as well um, because of the higher U.S. dollar and because of slower growth abroad, we're seeing some declines in exports and so manufacturing has stalled. Um, and that does impact our imports, exports and does impact our GDP growth rates. Um, but really, we think that's only going to slow us down a little bit. If, if we didn't have that pulling us down, um, probably pulling off about 0.5 percent off of GDP, it would probably be about 3.5 percent growth for the economy as a whole next year. So still, most of the key components of the economy are moving in the positive direction. I'd like to shift over to inflation real quickly. Um, obviously, we've pointed out the low oil prices. That is pulling down inflation. Um, right now, inflation is about 0.5 percent over the past year. Um, as we move a little bit further in the middle part of the year, those impacts from the lower oil prices from a year ago, from a little bit longer ago than that, will start to dissipate. We'll start to see inflation creep up. But really, the cap of that's going to be about 2.2 percent or 2.2 by the end of this year. Still a very tepid rate for inflation. We're not expecting big pickups in inflation. Really, that's right around the Fed's goal, about 2 percent target for inflation rate. So I just mentioned the Fed obviously made big news last month. The Fed kicked off the next tightening cycle with a very modest 0.25% increase in the federal funds effective rate. Um, you know, really, we expect the Fed to move very cautiously over the next year. They're going to kind of start to look at the numbers, see what they feel is a, is a strong number from the economy. But they're gonna probably going to see about three to four tightenings over the next year, averaging about one per quarter. If you see our forecast there, we have the federal funds rate at 1.25 by the end of 2016. So that's averaging about one rate hike of 0.25% each quarter. Um, that's very gradual. Um, the key point there is that's very gradual compared to past cycles. Usually you see about 2% of increase in the first year of a tightening cycle. So that's very gradual and telling us that monetary policy is still going to be very accommodative. Um, there's not a big concern for us on that dragging down growth for several years. Uh, monetary policy always acts with a very extended lag and really from a lot of successive rate hikes and successive action by the Fed to try to slow down the economy. It takes about three, maybe four years once you start a tightening cycle before it really starts to impact the economy to a substantial degree. So 
In the meantime, you know, we're not very fearful about an economic downturn in the next year or two. Um, when you start to get out three to four years, you know, maybe at that point, but still tells us in the meantime, should see some pretty strong growth, mainly led by consumers and led by that job growth that we're seeing that's very strong. Um, talk about rates real quick. Obviously, short-term rates, those, imp those rates you see at banks from, the, from your savings rates and from your CD rates, those are going to go up over the next year, likely in line with what Fed policy is, probably about 75 to 100 basis points over the next year. So not much, but still an improvement of where we've been for the last eight years. And finally, long-term rates, like those that impact mortgage, mortgages and 10-year uh, and Treasury rates, those will go up a little more gradually. We expect the 10-year to be about 3% by the end of 2016. Right now it's about 2.2 to 2.3, so about 70 to 80 basis points. And that's pretty typical. You see short-term rates go up a little more rapidly than long-term rates um, because long-term rates react more to supply demand issues than direct Fed policy. Um, we still have a little bit of a downside risk for long-term rates, as we have seen over the past couple of years, a lot of flight to quality action from foreign investors coming into those long-term rates probably putting a little bit of a downward pressure and yet again saying uh, we're not going to see as much of an increase for long-term rates over the next year as those short-term rates. So thank you for your time and for your attention. Uh, at this point, I'll bring Mark up and we'll have a little friendly banter. Uh, thanks again to the comments from uh, Bill and Ben. Uh, and thanks again to the, to the Metropolitan Club for allowing me to be a part of this every year. It's always a lot of fun, and I hope it's something that uh, I certainly learned a lot from it, and I'm hoping that we can all share some knowledge on that. Um, I, I wanted to go through some questions kind of quickly about the, uh, the forecast that both of you have made, and then kind of use our remaining time to get into some other things I wanted to, uh, to go into. Um, first of all, Bill, we can't go forward without looking backward a little bit. Um, last year, um, the story I wrote about your forecast said you used a downright cheerful speech, um, and yet you turned out to be a little, even that was, that was cautious. What, what do you think changed um, that turned out to be so much better than what you thought? Well, the, the real problem with forecasting is uh, that the numbers stink. Um, I, I, this is a family show, so I'll just say the numbers <laughs> stink. Um, the problem is that we get these estimates of employment every month, and they're wrong. They're always wrong. Uh, it just so happens that last year they were a little bit less wrong than they were in prior years. So what I do to do this forecast is I actually do three forecasts, only one of which you see. One, I, 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 I forecast the U.S. job growth in every sector, uh, quick and dirty so I don't share it. Uh, I use uh, very good statistics uh, for kind of a background that only go up to last June. And then I use the statistics that you and I talk about every month that are wrong. And so um, that's good th to know. Th that's <laughs> I always say that, Mark. It's no surprise. Um, so um, that that's really the problem that you have. Forecasting a trend like we're in now is really easy, really easy. When it gets when, when things are going well. Well, just when things are going in a in the direction, same direction. In the same direction. You, you have big problems at uh, peaks and troughs. Uh, those forecasts are always laughably wrong. The, um, the forecast that you've put out, Bill, um, is so much stronger than what we're seeing on the national level or even in, in the state of Ohio. I guess the two of you, I know we kind of go through this every year, it seems like, but what makes it so that we're doing so much better than, our, than the state as a whole or the nation as a whole? I think that, well, obviously part of it is that when you compare Columbus to the Midwest, our economy is completely different from what a typical Midwest region is, which is very manufacturing-centric. Um, there's nothing wrong with manufacturing as such. The problem is that manufacturing has been going through this 20, 30 year um, trend of substituting 
uh, capital for labor, technology for labor. You have all these communities that were, that grew up over time to support a much larger employment base, a much more affluent employment base than what they have now. And so most metros, especially in the Midwest, are really in a continuing period of uh, deciding what they want to be next. And we have the luxury not to have to worry about that. Along with that, we have population growth of about 1.1% per year compared to about 0.7.8 for the, the nation. And so uh, I, I would argue that a good chunk of that is due to our strong economy. So it's really kind of a virtuous cycle that we get ourselves into. But that larger population base creates larger consumer demands. There's a huge swath of any community's economy that's designed to support um, local consumers, local businesses. Ben? I would definitely echo that a lot. Um, if you're looking nationally, the two sectors that have done the best throughout this recovery and, and, and expansion have been education and healthcare. And those are two key sectors for the local area. Um, you know, obviously, all the universities, the Ohio Health, all the all the healthcare jobs that we have here in, in the Columbus area. I think you know those because we have such a bigger emphasis on those two sectors as opposed to some of the cities around us. That's that's been the reason why we've done so well. I'd like to get into uh, both of your forecasts a little bit deeper, Bill locally, Ben nationally. You, you all, you both have touched on a couple of little things uh, regarding sectors that you would like to see or that you're thinking are going to do well. Um, I guess, Bill, first of all, on, on some of the things locally that you're seeing on what sectors you think are going to do well in 2016. And Ben, the uh, same thing nationally. Um, and please talk about energy a little bit. I know, um, you know, uh, oil price is 11 year low this morning. Uh, good for us as consumers, not so good for uh, states that depend on uh, oil production as a, as a key uh, for employment. And that includes Ohio now, um, even though it's just a small, uh, small part of our, our state economy. So if you guys could just talk a little bit about sectors that you guys think would be particularly do well, maybe some that aren't so well, do, do so well this year. Well, I think the, the best sector of all uh, this year, last year, for a number of years in the past is education and healthcare. Um, education and healthcare, it turns out, is responsible for one of every four net new jobs in central Ohio during this recovery. Um, I, have, I have warned in the past that uh, we are going to see slower growth in this sector at some point. Obviously, my forecast this year uh, uh, believes that this won't be the year, but at some point that sector's got to slow down. I like two-thirds of business services. I like professional and technical services. And I like corporate management. Business services as a whole is keeping pace with the national average, and it's doing very well. Um, and uh, these two subsectors, the technical services and the corporate management, are pulling it up. Corporate management during the recovery has grown 70% faster than average. Professional and technical services had a little bit of a stumble um, early in the recovery, but they've definitely uh, made that up. Uh, the one sector or the one subsector of business services I don't like quite so much is administrative support. And the reason why I don't like that so much is simply because a lot of those jobs are temp jobs. And a lot of those temp jobs are becoming permanent jobs and are moving from that sector into the sector where their employment is. And so that's actually not a bad thing at all. Uh, finally, I like transportation and distribution, which is transportation and warehousing 
plus wholesale. Uh, that was very worrisome early in the recovery, and it was worrisome in part because it was growing so slowly, shrinking actually, and that's a mainstay for this economy. And it's finally outperforming very nicely again. As a matter of fact, um, I think one of the sectors that I may be lowballing in my 2016 forecast is transportation. Uh, a couple sectors I don't like, manufacturing, as Ben said. Um, uh, there are some nasty numbers that have come out recently. Um, and employment growth is slowing in part because of the switch to technology. I don't like retail, and I don't quite know why. Because um, <laughs> employment growth in retail is, has been one-third of the U.S. average. Um, over the recovery. Uh, our employment concentration's fine. Um, we have really no problems with retail that, that show up in the numbers, but I'm wondering if um, retail employment growth is being impacted by uh, Central Ohio's greater than average tendency to shop in larger stores rather than smaller stores, which a report from Chase brought out. Mm -hmm couple yeah. months ago. And leisure and hospitality I don't like simply because it got ahead of itself in the recovery. It's now digesting its earlier gains. Ben? I would definitely add housing to the list of the positive ones. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of the drivers of housing demand is really are tied to the labor market. Um, particularly, as I mentioned before, we're finally seeing those millennials start to form, form households. And that's been something we've been waiting for. There's a lot of pent-up demand um, from the very large millennial generation for housing. Um, we have, at Nationwide, we have our own housing indicator called the Health of Housing Markets Report um, that really tells us at the national level and at all of the 400 MSAs that we look at across the country um, that housing is doing very well. The only areas where you do see some impact is because of the job losses, because of the energy sector. Um, and those will probably continue. Um, we, we aren't expecting a big increase in oil prices. The, the supply glut, worldwide supply glut that we're seeing across the world uh, does not look to be um, ending anytime soon, and that should keep oil prices down to a certain degree. Probably not lower than where they are now, but certainly you could see a little bit of an increase, um, but not going to see a big increase in oil likely over the next year or two. Um, and that will impact those areas like Texas, North Dakota, um, Louisiana, Mississippi, all those kind of places that are very energy intensive states with their employment and with their focus for the industries, those are going to do a little poorly over the next year or two. Um, but overall, if you look at the, you know, it's definitely un unambiguously positive for the U.S. economy overall. Um, you know, most people do not work, most areas do not work in oil production and lower oil prices, this puts more money in people's pockets to go out and spend and push the economy to a faster pace of growth. Uh, ben, you've noted that um, nationally forecast, again, to produce about 100 or 200,000 jobs a month this year. And now the country, our, un our unemployment rate nationally, 5%. Uh, U.S. has gained about 13 million jobs since the, uh, uh, since the recession ended. Um, and I'm going to do one of, the, one, of you, one of the economist things. On the other hand, <laughs> um, we have a lot of people who have dropped out of the labor force, a lot of people very discouraged. We're having huge shifts in our economy, a lot of people being left behind. Um, how would you kind of rate, now that we've been out of this thing, with all these jobs that, we, that, we, that we've created, are, are, we, are we kind of back? Have we kind of recovered everything? Are we sort of back to where we should be as far as the total number of jobs that were lost, or are we still in somewhat of a hole? I think we're most of the way there. Um, if, if you look at the raw numbers, we're four million jobs above the pre-recession peak. Um, so we've made back all those jobs we lost during the recession, and we've added four million more. That's a lot of people. Um, certainly there are some concerns. Um, as we mentioned before, if you, if you look at the, the kind of looking below the top line numbers, looking below the top line unemployment rate, if you look more like a U6, which includes underemployment, so those people that would like to work full time but they cannot work full time, that's closer to about nine and a half to 10 percent of the labor force. That's a little bit higher, it's still a little concerning um, for us. Um, but really, if you look at the most folks, look at most people that are impacted by the labor market, things are very good. Um, we feel like we're most of the way back. And another thing to keep in mind is we still got a little ways to go. It's not like we're at the peak right now. As I said, we don't expect a downturn in the economy for at least three to four years. Um, so we have three to four years of more growth, and it'll move us further up towards the point where we're saying we're at a very good place. So we're getting close to uh, Q&A time. And so 
Um, I got one more thing I wanted to ask about. Obviously, not getting any, anywhere even close to what we're, I'd hope we could cover. Um, we'll, we could all stick around for another hour, I suppose, and talk about this stuff more, but I think we all have things to do. Um, the one thing that's really bothered me over the past year is um, this issue with people who have been left out of our, our economic growth here in Columbus. The, um, I think everybody in this room would agree that our economy in Columbus has been stellar. It's a star in the Midwest, no doubt about it. Our unemployment rate was 3.9% um, in November, and uh, job creation has been, has been outstanding. Yet we have a large segment of our people in Columbus who have been left behind. We had uh, complimentary reports re released last year by the Columbus Foundation, and uh, J.P. Morgan Chase uh, noted an amazing disconnect. 30,000 people between the ages of 16 and 24 are neither in school nor working. That's 30,000 people, an amazing number. 12% of our youth population. Um, in addition, 145,000 people in the region don't have a high school degree or the skills to get a job in one of our growing sectors of our economy. Employers complain that they have trouble filling openings because they say applicants don't have the right credentials, have a poor attitude, or fail a drug test. As a result, our economy is being held back. Our poverty rate has gone up to 18%, even as our unemployment rate has fallen. It hurts tax collections, costs us taxpayers plenty in terms of public benefits. Um, Chase, in fact, calculated the loss at $1.1 billion for our metro area. Um, for, on the other hand, the young people say that they want to work. They want to be a part of things, but they're struggling to find directions. What the heck is going on? Well, I, I think that... Uh... I think that there are skills gaps. There are definitely skills gaps. I've, I've talked to employers really all over the state. And the, the thing that comes up again and again and again is soft skills. Employers tell me that they, that, uh, uh, that they don't have, they can't find people who uh, can interact effectively with others, who can follow direction, who can be to work on time, um, who, uh, who just are a suitable person to be in the workplace. Drugs are definitely a problem. One employer in southeastern Ohio told me that he could hire 10 more people on the spot if he could find people with the right skills who could pass a drug test. And then you have improving technology and the need to stay current with that technology throughout the economy. So that's a problem. Uh, ben? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I definitely agree with the skills gap. I, I think that is an issue that's happening at the national level as well, if you just look at the numbers. Um, one of the key things we look at here is how, how hard is it for employers to find what they want to look for. Um, the jobs opening rate um, at the national level is 3.6 percent, which doesn't sound very high, but that's actually the peak it's been since 2000. Um, so that tells us that a lot of employers, they, they have openings, they have, you know, specific skills they're looking for, um, but they're not able to find the people that they want for those positions. Um, you know, from an econ econ economic perspective, that should mean higher wages because they're going to have to raise wages to draw people from other, from other areas. But that also tells us that there are some people that are being left behind, some people that need to get those trainings and skills because the jobs are available out there. Of course, it's the tradition of the CMC to take questions from the audience at this point. Um, when you queue up, please state your name, ask your question, and we thank you in advance, of course, for not making long editorial comments. Let's go with the first question. Uh, no long editorial comment. Mark Barbash from Finance Fund. I'm tempted to ask again every year, like we usually ask, as to whether are we over-retailed, but I won't ask that question. I want to come back to what you were just talking about. And I'm wondering whether with all the, with, with the issues of poverty, with the issue of, the, uh, of the, the labor participation rate, the issue of stagnant wages, whether all of these, whether we're really going to work our way out of those issues by the improving economy, or whether we are dealing with something that is more fundamental, both demographically, technologically, and global markets, that say we need to be thinking about additional strategies to deal with it. For example, poverty has never been seen as an economic development strategy, but it seems to me 
solving the poverty problem, solving the, oh, okay, I'll stop the speech, solving the disconnect between where people live and where people work, which means they can't get a job that pays well enough to pay the babysitter and to drive the car or take the bus to where they work. I'm just wondering whether we have something that is a little bit more fundamental to the economy that we will not be working our way out of and we need to be thinking of additional strategies. Well, last year, um, I did some work for this speech uh, where I looked at uh, the number and wage level of jobs uh, that require a degree and that don't require a degree. What I found was that the, that the number of jobs requiring a degree had increased dramatically since before the recession and paid on an inflation-adjusted basis the same. The jobs that didn't require a degree were fewer and paid less. And so when I took a deeper look at that question, what I found was that the uh, lowest skills jobs, the entry level jobs, had only declined by a little bit and their wages had only declined by a little bit. The jobs that required a little bit more training were far fewer and paid a lot less. And when you look at what those jobs are, they're jobs in maintenance and repair, they're jobs in production, and uh, those kinds of jobs got hit hard, hard in the recession. And so my guess is that they've probably come back to a degree um, over the last year or so. Uh, the, the, especially with our growing uh, distribution sector, that could be helpful. But I can see that there are probably a bunch of people who were making reasonably good money before the recession who had to uh, take lower skill jobs because they didn't have a degree and the jobs that were suitable for their training weren't there. So, uh, and the other thing to remember is that uh, the poverty rate is far, far less than what you really need to live on. One, one more thing. I was in doing some prep for today. The, um, um, the state has told me that they are, they are now trying to, they're creating a program. I'm stumbling here. I'm sorry. The, the, um, one of the things the state has made it clear to me, and we've talked about this, is that this is not a one-size-fits-all kind of solution. It's going to take an individualistic kind of approach. Um, and the state has tried to do this is with the new program that they've got working through the jobs and family services groups where they can actually work with individual families trying to identify what it is that is holding them back. Because um, it's different things for different people. You know, it could be child care. It could be transportation. It could be not finishing school. It could be a lot of different things and trying to figure that out and then helping work through the solution um, on an individual basis may be something that works better. Okay, next question. Good afternoon. I'm Kathy Fox with Pizzuti. Um, there was a, a news headline today that more people left Ohio than came to Ohio recently, and um, yet our population is growing. Is there a point at which the state, the condition of the state, will affect our ability to succeed? And if so, what should we do about it? Oh, it already has. Um, I can't point to numbers that tell you that it has, but if you th look at the population of Ohio as a whole over the last four or five years grew 57,000. The population of central Ohio grew 92,000. And so if, um, if you take central Ohio out of Ohio, uh, Job growth's been much less. Population is shrinking. Now, the argument that I always make is that companies here have customers there. And that includes the retailers at Polaris. And so to the extent that the rest of Ohio is struggling, we fail to live up to our potential. And so uh, I, I wish I knew an easy answer to the, the problem, but it's definitely a problem and it's definitely affecting us.
Hi, I'm Laura Ellswick, and my question is, Bill, you mentioned that we're far behind in um, people who are self-employed and new businesses. So what are some of the things that we should be doing or are doing to rectify that? Well, uh, there are a number of things that we are doing. One very, very important thing that we've done is that the city has created a uh, small business concierge, um, who is Ryan Schick, who is in the audience. And that his, his role is to help people start and grow businesses. But I think the way to attack the problem uh, is really to look both at the supply of businesses and the demand for businesses. We have all kinds of resources available to help small businesses start and grow. I took advantage of them, but I took advantage of them because in my former role, I knew about them. And so I can't imagine that there are a lot of people who know that a small business development center, for example, exists, whose services are free. That I can't believe that there are a lot of people who know that the library has all sorts of resources that, again, are free. So we got to communicate that. We've also got to communicate to consumers and to purchasing managers of businesses that purchase decisions are not innocuous. That if we, if we patronize local businesses, the money stays in the local economy. If we buy our coffee at Starbucks, the money goes to Seattle. It's, it's as simple as that. You don't have to shift a lot, but shifting a little helps a lot. Well, one of the things that's also come up too that may be a problem is our sort of Midwestern personality. Mm -hmm. You know, we tend to be kind of conservative people not risky, don't like to take chances, and, you know, if you fail, ah. yeah. so, so, I mean, there's other parts of the country where failing's okay, and so it's okay to start your business, and if it flops, you know, you go on to the next one, and you've learned from that to go to the next one. Um, I don't know how you change the, change our personality, I mean, that, that, that's, that, that's an issue. Personality, well, attitudes can be changed. And so I think we need to, as a community, lift up entrepreneurs, just ordinary people who took a deep breath and took a chance. Um, and there are a lot of us. There need to be more. Hi, Julie Graber, Gender EQA. Bill, your comment about the employer who's looking for people could hire right now if it um, they could pass a drug test and showed up for work. Um, it always kind of frustrates me because there are folks over 50 who have that work ethic, don't have the likelihood of an uh, addiction problem, um, but they're being, that's, they are one of those groups being left behind in the recovery. Um, the New York Times just had an article about how women over 50 um, are a large percentage of the long-term unemployed. How, maybe not a fair question, but how do we bridge that disconnect in the recovery? Well, as luck would have it, I have just joined the Board of Employment for Seniors. Uh, my first board meeting is in two weeks. That is an organization whose mission is to connect uh, mature job seekers with employers and to help employers understand that these folks have the skills that they need. So it, it's, it's a great organization. I'm really eager to start my work. Hi, Laura Kaprowski with the Mid-Ohio Regional Planning Commission. My question is, I mean, we've talked a lot about skill sets, um, but what about place and what about um, the quality of life in a community in a region I mean how is that factor in the growth of economy and um, are there metrics that are following that or can give some kind of concrete feedback on that not that I know well uh, quality of life is 
such a, a subjective concept. Um, I, I live in the central part of Columbus because I like to live in the central part of Columbus. I like a large city and I like to be close to everything. There are a lot of people for whom that would be repulsive, um, who like 10 acres, who like to be out in the country. And so quality of life is different things to different people. Um, I think to a large extent, um, just the, the fact that there are so many of us who come to central Ohio and um, we may come like I did to do a degree at Ohio State and somehow forget to leave. Um, and that I think is testament to the fact that we have a quality of life here that's attractive to a lot of people. But how you measure that, maybe through a survey, I don't know. Since I don't have a shadow behind me, um, that I'm the last person. Uh, Jane, with your permission, may I editorialize and introduce just one second? <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, Mark, no offense, we talked about this last year. One of the, um, my name is Ryan Schick. I'm the City of Columbus's Small Business Concierge. And what I would like to do is I would like to challenge, um, not challenge, but I would like to invite anybody who has any interest in seeing the entrepreneurial spirit of Columbus and see that the wonderful ideas that we rave about and that were recognized in Inc. and Entrepreneur Magazine, if any of you know, we were actually ranked the number third hot ups, uh, startup hotbed in the world by Inc. Magazine last month, which is something we're very, very proud of. But Columbus is no longer being risk averse. Um, we don't have to go to Starbucks to see it. We have to go to Mission Coffee, which is one of the best cups of coffee I've ever had in the city. And I would love to buy anybody in this room a cup of coffee. Please email me at smallbiz at columbus.gov, and I will show you what's going on in this city. And I know Bill will join us, because he is an absolute advocate and cheerleader for what we have going on, because something big is happening. Pardon the, uh, I'm going to remove the expletive, but my very first event that I did when I came home with my wife is I said, there is something bleep going on in Columbus, and I'm really excited about it. So please, um, if you really are interested, again, it's smallbizbiz at columbus.gov, and my name is Ryan Schick. Thank you. And I, I am always, always happy to uh, share my own journey uh, with anybody who who would find it useful, because um, self-employment is where it's at. <laughs> I, no more W-2s ever. There you go. Well, let me uh, first remind, let's thank this panel uh, so much for their uh, insight today. Always a wonderful conversation. Let me remind Ryan and the rest of us that it's not just the folks in the room you just promised that to, but we're, we air everywhere in Ohio, including uh, Columbus Television and WSU through PBS affiliates, so you will have a lot of coffee to buy, my friend. I just wanted you to know that. Let's thank our uh, sponsors and partners today, Columbus State Community College, uh, BDO, Fifth Third Bank, and the Columbus Dispatch, along with all of our speakers today, Mr. Bill Lafayette, Ben Ayers, and Mark Williams. Give them another round of applause for all of their support. Special thanks again to our friends at Leadership Columbus for partnering with us today as well. And uh, we are going to end today's forum, but we invite you to uh, linger around the lobby for coffee and cookies. For our panelists, we have a new CMC mug for our 40th anniversary, so you can enjoy coffee on us for the rest of the year. Thank you very much. <laughs>